how are you? I'm very good, Deborah. How are you doing today? I'm great. You I'm must be uh, incredibly busy and uh, this environment. How, how would you compare this environment to some of the other challenging environments we've been in and, and how is your relationship with your clients continuing to adjust? Yeah, I mean, every crisis in the world is different from 9-11 to 2008-2009 and is a whole separate dynamic. But this is the first one that really that came, came out of the blue that um, forced everybody to go in a different direction completely than what we anticipated on in, in the most drastic of ways. And so changing behaviors, changing how we work, changing how we rely on people. You know, we have an industry that's really in supply chain that's based upon checking the checkers. And uh, yeah. you know, we can't do as much of that anymore just because you, you can't waste money and time and people on, on rechecking things. You have to really have a trust relationship. So I say um, the validation of trust or the economies of trust between two people becomes more critical right now um, than ever before than any other crisis. Uh, you have to be able to work and know what the other side is doing and believe in the outcome. Thank you. Um, so we're going to get things started. So good afternoon and welcome everyone to Corsite Conversations. I'm your host, Deborah Weinswig, and I'm very honored to have as our guest, Jason Craw, who's an executive director at Lee and Fung and has been a colleague of mine for years. Today, we're going to discuss how COVID-19 is affecting the retail supply chain, how retailers have changed and adapted from week one of the crisis to now, and how and when retailers should begin thinking about planning for the future. As always, we'll have a transcript and video available on our site within 24 hours, and we will launch poll questions after, uh, well, let's call it after five minutes into the call. And then lastly, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during our conversation if you would like to ask a question. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Jason just to tell us a little bit more about himself. Uh, I've been doing this 28 years. Uh, I've been with Lee and Fung since 2012. I sold my organization, FRC, to them um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in sort of a goal of globalizing and being partners on another scale. Um, I, I'm eight years into my Lee and Fung relationship and uh, having the best time of my life with these people, breaking new barriers and uh, exploring new horizons. So I'm based in New York. And uh, we're working in all different areas of supply chain for, and pretty much touch every piece of it from concept, product, finance, analytics, every piece of it. And so um, the, the, the needs of being fluid are, 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 are critical now more than ever, but uh, Lee and Fung has certainly uh, uh, gave me a great platform to do it in. And have you seen, you know, you talked about, Jason, a lot of these different areas that Lee and Fung works in and that you yourself work in, are you seeing clients are asking you to do more? Uh, is it more broad? Is it more deep? And, and what do you think happens with this outsourcing economy? Well, in the short term, we've seen a lot of our clients, uh, retailers and brands, um, uh, furlough a lot of employees. So there's a lot less hands to, to do the work that's needed. And there's still a lot of work going on to deliver the next season, fall and holiday, which will be new product that is out there now. And so we've seen people in the immediate short term rely on us to take over a lot of functions that they were doing themselves. It could be uh, color approvals, fit approvals, TD, design roles. Uh, how do we help people speed things up? You know, speed in decision making or uh, bring down risk uh, is a big area. So that's, that's been the, uh, the short term. Uh, in the long term, we're seeing that uh, you know, the world is, is looking at the sort of outsource economy as the new normal. Um, if you're a retailer, you need to focus on retailing. And if you're a brand, you need to focus on what you do best, but you can't do everything. And you're gonna have to, there's a finite amount of money and time and you're gonna have to invest it where you get the best return rate. And so we see that there's gonna be a lot of outsourcing in general into the future in a lot of different areas. Uh, and, and we play in a couple of big pieces of them in the supply chain. Um, one of the biggest areas we've seen is, is is, is the move from traditional design to 3D design or digital platforming, uh, digital um, um, supply chain and decision-making. Uh, it's, it's about speed and it's about getting the right information as quick as possible, especially in today's environment. So Jason, during SARS, you know, I was a Wall Street analyst at the time and, you know, we started to see a complete change in terms of how people design product and how retailers, vendors, supply chain, how everyone interacted. But it felt like there was a snap back, and I was actually quite surprised, but there's a snap back to kind of, you know, the normal way of working, you know, within 12 months. How do you think this time is different? 
Well, we've been on this path of digitalizing our whole industry for, for, for four or five years now. This is not a new trend. It's just when you have this pain point right now, it's, it's speeding things up at a, at a 10x pace that you have to get, you get, to get to where you need to go in a lot quicker, uh, short amount of time. And so it's not new. So in, in the past, there wasn't a wholesale change of, of, of the industry. We've already been on that path of a change. And so embracing uh, digital ways of working has been happening for three, four years. Some companies quicker than others, but everybody has some degree of it. But it's going to be the new normal. You're going to have to be able to work quicker. It's, if you think about speed, our, our greatest currency in decision making today is speed. Um, if you can make a better decision quicker, you're that much better off than you, than you would be in the past. And if you look at the sort of uh, product, consumer product sort of timeline, you might have a third of your timeline in the actual production of your product and two thirds of your timeline in the pre-development, and that could be sort of designing, milestones, iteration, decision, next meeting. And by the time you actually get to that decision, you still have your same you know, period of time to produce it. We want to compress that decision-making time by 70 or 80 percent. And by having digital assets, it enables you to do that with accuracy, with reliability, and ability to react on it to influence your business. Uh, it, it, right now, when things come out of this sort of uh, sort of brief pause we've been in while we're um, at, at, at all going through stay orders. When this thing ends and we come back and we think about the back half of the year, there's going to be a lot of people that have to jump on buying products and making decisions very quickly to get things in production because things have been frozen uh, for, for a period of time now. So the only way to make those decisions is to really embrace 3D and, and, and using the digital platforms. So if we if we see this significant reduction in terms of you know time and speed is a new currency, aren't there several positives which we that come out of this right? You know sustainability because we we make less product that people don't want right as trends continue to change, you know at a you know new pace. How does that really not only for for twenty twenty which is a very unique year, but how does this change things longer term? Well, we've been we've been moving that that direction. Um, we have to take waste out of the supply chain in general, waste out of our businesses, waste out of everything we're doing, and, and invest that money where it needs to go. So productivity and focus has been key. Um, this environment now is just ramping up, and it's going to fast track from here. We think that this environment today has fast tracked us, but. Uh, it's forever going to be changing how we go to market and you're going to see the rest of the world continue to fast pace the adoption of these technologies to kind of um, to get a competitive advantage uh, to reduce costs to make better decisions you know it, it's it's kind of repetitive but um, it, it, it really does do all these things Deborah you're muted I know that you've been talking to, thank you, a lot of clients about 3D design and virtual showrooms and, and changing the way that they work. What helps them kind of get over that hurdle now, right? What's the, you know, what kind of gets them to the other side? And do you think these are, are long-term changes? And do they have the talent internally to address these changes? Well, that's another reason why there's a lot of outsourcing is that a lot of the talent may not be trained up on 3D everywhere you look around the world. So they will be. People are investing in it. People are training. Uh, people are going to need uh, high caliber skilled people to help them in the short term. But digital showroom enables you to showcase products without being there. You don't have to get on a plane and travel there. You don't have to be in their office. Uh, and you can make decisions at a very uh, efficient way by, 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 by embracing this. Uh, a lot of brands have been using 3D showrooms for years. This is not, not necessarily new. Uh, we have many within our, on our customer base that have been doing it for three and four years. Uh, it's been moving that way. Um, it, it's really enhancing the amount of information we have because you can see things quicker. You can see more variety. And, and that's another point. When you're going through a quite period of uncertainty, you kind of sometimes don't know the right products to put in the store. So we're seeing people say, okay, how do we get more variety for more people's needs? Uh, as, as people in the world, um, as unemployment goes up, 
how, how, how are we going to uh, have products that people want and demand now? So you have to design more products. And if you design more products, you have to have more variety of those products. So the one thing that people think is that variety sometimes means cheap or cheaper. It, it means better value. It, you know, it, it, and that's a real key point is how do we have better value products for people, not just cheaper products? So if, if we kind of stay with that thread, what does that mean for this holiday where there's a lot of angst and concern and, you know, I'm sure you are and we are getting tons of questions in terms of, you know, when should we think about reordering and how should we think about ordering for holiday? Can you walk us through that thread? Well, what people assumed they were going to be buying two months ago is very much going to be changed today. And so when people reevaluate what they're going to bring in and how much of it, they're going to have to sort of change their philosophies. So they're going to have to be designing new products. They're going to have to be jumping on uh, flexible supply chains. They're going to need a very diverse supply chain to actually make it happen in a short amount of time, which is one of the things that we do uh, really well by being truly global in so many markets that, you know, if there's going to be a continuation of a trade war, which you don't know, and then you need flexibility to make it somewhere else. So now this comes back to decision-making speed. The quicker you can get to the right information to make the best decisions, enables you to actually then have more time to get that product made and, and into the market. So that kind of comes back to, you don't have time to make things in a traditional sense and you need to embrace digital even more so than ever. So Jason, you and I together have talked about innovation as, you know, kind of across all different ideas over time and anything from, you know, 3D printing to computer vision, you know, to 3D design. What are you seeing in terms of retailers thinking about innovation, you know, this design thinking, you know, are they at, like, is the pace changing now where we sit today? And how do you think that impacts them, you know, for the future where I think you and I both agree things have been a bit slower uh, than we would have expected. Well, yeah, because we've been we started our our path into this into this world like four plus years ago, yeah. um, and we really felt the world would have ramped up uh, even quicker than it has been. But we're really at that point now where uh, everyone has dabbled with it. A lot of people are using it exclusively. The others who don't are now moving towards it. And uh, um, we're seeing a lot of demand from, from people that were maybe not our clients in the past asking us to help them out with uh, 3D, help them digitalize, help them reduce overheads and outsource. And so there, there is a, a, a new normal to all of this. And um, this is just fast tracking what was already happening. And, and sometimes we need an event to steer things in a different direction. Uh, and uh, this, this, this you know, is a terrible event affecting the world but also long-term will we'll definitely force and, and promote our entire world of, of, of being more digital, uh, which was already happening anyways. In so it, in my own personal path on kind of 3D design and working with some of the um, schools like FIT and Parsons, one of the challenges we found is just there's not enough kind of 3D designers and you know, kind of to take traditional pattern makers and to turn them into 3D designers was kind of a non-starter. So how, how, is, how are you getting the talent? How are you finding the talent? And you know, is that the competitive edge that Lee and Fung has? It very much is. Uh, you know, our CEO made a, a focused investment uh, three plus years ago to say that we're really gonna take a stand in 3D plus digital platforms in general, but leading the way into 3D and starting to train the design teams and the TD teams uh, on the basis of, of, of how to work in this environment. So. We've built ourselves a center of excellence in Asia, which is a, a very deep, probably by far the biggest um, uh, volume ability of anyone out there to handle 3D, where we can handle thousands of, of, of styles a week. Um, most teams around the entire organization are trained in 3D, uh, designing in 3D. There's no more 2D work in a lot of our business models. Uh, and, and it's really kind of transformed how we do everything. Um, you can see your pattern in 24 hours on an actual one-for-one -one garment, less than 24 hours. You can make decisions on exactly how it will look in production. We could fit it in 3D. We're doing that across many of our business units and, and, and dozens and dozens of our customers. Uh, so the entire process can be turned virtual, and it already is, but uh, 
Uh, we've been training for years to do it. We're now training everybody that comes into the group in the design area to have to be able to work within that environment because 3D is touching every business unit of, of, our, of our universe. So if, if we kind of just look at the timeline that we're on, how have retailers, you know, kind of changed and adapted from week one of, of the crisis? And, you know, let's, let's end there and then I have a follow on question to that. So in the very beginning, it was a, it was a, what's going on here? Let's wait and see. Let, let's, uh, let's uh, see what we have to do. And then there was uh, the sort of panic that kind of came into the, the space. Um, but that's sort of normal in the crisis, right? What's going on? Panic. Or, and then, then practical thinking generally uh, comes back into things thereafter. So we've had like the panic phase, right? And then there's kind of the realization of, of where we are and then maybe the recovery. How do you think about kind of different phases or different buckets? And, you know, just even as you think about your own business and since you've had the fortunate, um, you know, kind of look to China, how do you kind of think that we'll, we'll all get through this together? So we've been staying really close with our customers. We've been seeing what we can do to help where they need outsource help or us to take over certain roles. We've been very much uh, aggressive to be uh, lending a helping hand and, and being there to help the process. You know, how can we um, speed things up for people, give people flexibility, um, you know, change products uh, by using, I mean, a lot of customers have asked us to change the products we're producing and, and redesign based upon maybe getting a little more diverse than they were before, adding more products into the mix, giving more options into products. So it's been about being flexible and, and using all our tools to support the, uh, the customers that are out there. So we have the results of the poll and, you know, I, I would love to get your feedback. So on the second question, what percentage of your designs are being done with 3D design technology? Uh, over 55, well, 55% 55 have said zero. Is that what you would have expected? And is that what you're seeing from, you know, in general? It's, it's the reality. People, a lot of companies who say they're involved in 3D, um, they get a couple images in 3D, but they haven't really embraced it to where the building product in 3D. Uh, as, a, as a division of Lee and Fung, the division that I lead is just one of many divisions and we're all working this way. We design everything in 3D from the bottom up, from the, the high-end customer to the, to the moderate to the value. So 3D is part of our DNA and it, it is so across uh, the vast majority of Lee and Fung. But we've also started earlier. Uh, we realize that we have to speed up the process um, and this is how we're going to do it. We have to take uh, sampling out of the system. I mean, to make a sample for somebody can take three weeks or two, two weeks to three weeks or four weeks, depending on availability of the fabric. So if we can take something that took, you know, one month and bring it down to one day, and if we want to do fittings of products that would take one month and bring it down to one day, we can take two months to two or three or four days. And to have that much time in your pocket is, is something that is absolutely critical. Now, different spaces of, uh, uh, of retail and brands have embraced this uh, at different in, at different levels, um, but 3D has touched mostly everybody that we deal with. But uh, you can go back and look at Nikes and Adidas of the world who were who were working in 3D well before five years ago. So it's not necessarily new. It's actually not. Um, but the space the the pace of adaptation and how we're using it is being ramped up uh, exponentially. Is there any benefit to those who are early, right? Is there a first mover advantage or, or how do you think about, right? If somebody were to adopt it now, what does that mean for their, for their teams, for their supply chain and, and how does that, and, and also too on the other end, how are the factories, you know, kind of working in terms of accepting these digital designs? Well, there's a learning curve. So in the very beginning, when you're learning to use it, it, it is quite slow, but as you, as you build up capabilities and skills and use and time, you get very quick and proficient at it, just like anything. So um, there's no time other than the present. 3D is really important. Um, it really has to be part of how people think about building a business. And if you think about it also another way, sorry to kind of split the topic a little bit. Um, some of the most expensive investments we make in product development is in designers and product development directors technical design directors. These people are experienced, they have a, a very deep skill and, and they're some of the higher salaries that we have in our industry. 
But when you can leverage digital assets and do it in 3D and you can fit in 3D and you can do all these things to speed things up, uh, it, it enables us to, to make the investments we need to make in the right places or elevate the quality of the people we have because we can invest more because we don't need as many here and we can put the people where we need them. Um, you know, the, the focal points of our business is continuously tra- changing as we digitalize. And the supply chain of the future has many changes that, that, that are kind of affecting us. It's not just 3D. And so our, our, our core mission at Lee and Fung is to help customers um, digital, through the digitalization of the supply chain as we kind of lead into the future. And um, it, it's our core focus. And it's going to be a little different for everybody, but the easiest thing to jump into right away would be 3D. It, it, is, it is out there and, um, and it's at every level of retail and branding. Right. Well, we have a lot of questions already in the queue. And for those of you on the line, if you have any additional questions, uh, please just answer, enter them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I will ask Jason. So Jason, you discussed the digital showroom. How can you touch and feel the fabric? That to me is a challenge. Your thoughts, please. So in a digital showroom, uh, we, we would still provide a, a fabric hanger or a quality swatch of what the fabric is. So someone does kind of have to touch the fabric and know what it is. When we design for brands in 3D, we still send them the fabric hangers to approve. But other than that, everything else is, uh, is completely digital. So the cads would be digital, the fits are digital, the colors, the color multipliers are digital. But yeah, the swatch of fabric or the, you know, the feel and touch it, that is something that uh, has to happen. As we digitalize fabrics, we get all the features and textures of those fabrics. You can see, you know, the weave, you can see textures, you can see furs and plush, and, but you still have to be able to touch as well. Do you think there's a time where, you know, the technology is at such a level that we won't need to send back and forth physical samples? On a lot of product categories, you really don't. If, if you look at sort of like the pyramid of items that people run today, you know, a, a third of all the products are kind of like basic items. Uh, you know, your core commodities, basic socks, basic underwear, basic t-shirts. You know, these basics, um, the fabric is very well known exactly what it is. And when you specify what these items are, you know exactly what you're going to get. But then as you go further up, then everything else does need to have, uh, um, you know, you do need to see what it is. So in 3D, we may send the, fa- we send the fabric swatch for approval. We do everything else digital, but when we get to pre-production, we do send a physical garment to people to see the actual garment just before we cut it. And, and that's kind of um, the process we take. Uh, but the vast majority of the time that's burned is in the design phases, as well as the fit phases. Those are where we crunch the timeline. Okay. All right, another question uh, from the audience. How important will data become to help deliver speed to market and what kind of data would you leverage? Consumer preference data, competitive assortment, benchmarking, et cetera. Oh, all of them. So we have to look at what we know from the past. We have to know about what we're learning. We have to learn about what we're touching, what we're seeing, what we're scraping. So one of our, uh, one of our digital platform tools, something called a trend engine, where we're um, actively scraping multiple, uh, many dozens of retailer websites um, every single day and brand websites to pull information in looking at social media, uh, image recognition of what people are talking about, what people are searching about. You know, we're using every possible source of data to focus us into what is the right things to be designing into, to have the best information, to steer our decision-making, in, in, to give us the, you know, the absolute best knowledge behind us to be as spot on as possible. We don't have as much time for waste uh, as the past or guesswork, frankly, anymore. All right, thank you. And then in terms of embracing digital, on what specific products, clothing, hard goods, home textiles, et cetera? So we've been using it the most in our shoe business as well as apparel business. Apparel is the most diverse, but it's being used in our furniture business as well, in our beauty businesses. It's used pretty much everywhere that we touch in the supply chain, Um, but apparel has been where we've had the biggest amount of use. That makes a lot of sense. And what do you think, I mean, we've heard a lot of, um, you know, for packaging, like beauty packaging, uh, 3D design being a focus. What, what are you seeing from that front, like packaging in general? Well, packaging is where we spend a lot of time and, and a lot of waste. It's how the customer sees the product first. So we sample and we make more small changes and even more changes. You know, especially if you get involved in beauty products, you know, the packaging is, 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 is really the feature of the product. 
So you, you've seen 3D really been, uh, been used as a way to sort of speed up decision making and get more options and varieties and get to sort of exactly what people want to do quicker and not have to make samples of all of them because you just don't have the time or the resources anymore. No, oh, thanks. Uh, if you were to place an order into your supply chain, what is the current delivery you would be quoting out of? Vietnam, China, India, another country? That's a big question. I need another, uh, <laughs> I need another webinar. Um, <laughs> so let's say a traditional supply chain in, in a lot of the world uh, from uh, you know, from concept to iteration to decision making, placement, production, and shipment into the store, the entire cycle could be like anywhere from 42 to 50 weeks for a lot of the uh, companies uh, in the world. Uh, by using 3D, you could crunch that by half at least. Um, and that's like an easy answer. But there's ways of crunching it to weeks, not just, not just by half. And it's all about how much automation you use and how much trust you use. And as we digitalize the supply chain all the way through end to end, a lot of the pieces in, in our trust economy of having a great supplier and supply chain with you using digital, you can crush this down to, 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 to a few weeks, three weeks, four weeks. We've seen that happen in the real speed markets. And you can see it happening in the big scale markets by dropping to, the, you know, to 20 weeks when it was 50 weeks. So you can go as aggressive as you want to, provided you're willing to embrace all these tools. And we've been doing it. This is a very long question. Oh. And facing with the threat of entering new strong competitors to the market in coming years, we as a big player in the e-retailing market in the Middle East need to build up the logistics system to make sure we maintain a strong position in the market. What would be your advice about main points we can, con can concentrate on to have our barriers up in the following years from competitors to take over the market what is the best competitive strategy for focusing on? I'm not sure that's even uh, a, a digital supply chain question. It's more of a logistics question. I don't really think I'm the person to answer that in the small amount of time we have uh, right now. So I'll have to pass on that one. All right, and actually it, it leads into the next question, which is, you know, kind of, do you believe small to mid-sized retailers can keep up with large retailers in this digital supply chain? I think in a way that that's, you know, this is a smaller company is trying to figure out, right, uh, in this sea of larger companies, can they, you know, can they embrace digital design and digital technology and, and does that help them stand out? Or, or is small just, you know, a challenge right now? Absolutely. Actually, it, it, can, it can be easier to adapt in a smaller company than a larger company. It's hard to, to, to turn the aircraft carrier. Um, and so, you know, for sure, I mean, that's how you compete. This gives a competitive advantage for, for every type of company to, to get to market quick, to have better information, be able to go quicker than your competitors, um, you know, to be more right on what you're presenting. It, it provides many bites at the apple in terms of uh, uh, how, how medium or smaller sized companies can leverage these tools just as much as a bigger company can. Um, something that's really right is right for everybody. And how companies embrace it and apply it is going to be unique to each of their models and how they go to market. But it's totally a direction we're seeing across every space. And what about for companies who are, you know, are mainly online, let's say, you know, they're, they're, they started D2C and maybe they're starting to move, you know, into the physical world. How does this whole, and we've been asked this question many times, right? How should they think about, uh, you know, adopting 3D design and, and virtual showrooms, you know, and, and at what point kind of in their, you know, if you will, in their lifespan, um, and especially the early stages of their life cycle, where does, where does all that come into play? It, it comes into overhead costs in, in a big way. Um, designers can be really expensive and and so as you're a growing company the ability to put on exponential amount of additional design as your product mix gets wider and wider becomes really challenging to do so using 3d you can get more with less uh, you can also you know with your same team get more styles created you know you can do more volume you can do more with with uh, the people you already have so using these tools is, is, is very much uh, important for a company that's trying to, you know, cross a chasm, say, from just online to, 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 to brick and mortar as well. That's really, and uh, someone asked, what kind of vendors um, and retailers currently have virtual showrooms? We've seen it on the, the higher end brand side. Uh, so um, we've seen many of the, the sort of more luxury brands and active sport brands uh, all, all use digital showrooms already. We've seen a lot of the brands you see in department stores uh, currently use them. 
Um, I'm not going to go through a whole checklist of them, but I'd probably say <laughs> within our own mix, we have 50 or 60 that use virtual showrooms already and, and expanding. And then another question, uh, can retailers use virtual showrooms to sell to customers or is this mainly vendors selling to retailers? Or all? It's all actually. It, it's a way to engage customers with less travel and more immediate collective ways of presenting product. And how do you make your products look more cohesive and more focused and tell a story to whoever it is you're trying to tell it to and be able to do it without hopping on a plane to do it? Um, it's more important than ever. So this exercise of uh, the stay-at-home economy that we're in right now uh, is going to forever change how we travel and the amount of travel and how we engage and how we work. And uh, these are the tools we need to use to be even more proficient than the old ways of working. Exactly. All right, we've got two more questions as of right now. So what are your thoughts on the digitalization of the supply chain and how it impacts, you know, returns? Like do people, you know, are, are, are we finding, and I don't know how you would utilize, you know, figure this out numerically, but do we see that product is more successful because maybe more eyes have been on it when it's designed digitally? Not necessarily. I mean, just because the, the, the whole goal of, of designing something digitally that it looks exactly the same as the real thing. You can't tell them apart. And so when you see a digital product that's created and a real product that's been created, they, they, they look identical. You know, that's the whole, that's the whole beauty of it. So is it, is it going to do that? I, I, you know, to, for, I, I don't know. I mean, I would say um, the goal of 3D is to be able to mirror the real thing, to do it more efficiently. And uh, if one, doesn't, one does not give you exponential growth from the other and the ability to, 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 you know, to have better products. It still comes down to knowing your customer, knowing what they want, knowing what value you're creating, and how do we use these tools to deliver that product based on the knowledge we have to that customer in a quicker, more efficient, cost-effective, speedier way. You talk about this idea, Jason, about knowing your, your client and kind of knowing what it is that they would want, you know, that seems to me right now as we're, we're moving to this outsourcing economy, especially in supply chain, that that's incrementally important. Can you talk about that concept? We got to be local. So the first thing is, if you're sitting in New York, it's difficult to design something uh, for India and vice versa. So by our, our whole focus of our organization is that we're local in every, offer, in every global market we work in. And so we're, we have designers and product people and account managers local in every single country we're working in and where we're producing product for. So we really get to know the flavor locally of what's going on. So that local understanding of the market, the culture, the retail landscape, trend is critical in being able to offer additional resources to supplement what your clients are already doing. How can you bring more value and more options? How can you kind of engage them with a higher hit rate? The adoption rate is critical in these days. So, you know, by really understanding things, it's, it's, it's paramount that you're spot on with what you're doing. And by being local and global, um, yeah. like, you know, um, you know, design and work local, but scale global, you know, so. <laughs> oh, very helpful. All right, based on what you're seeing across your ecosystem, what are you anticipating will happen in the apparel market with regards to fall holiday 20 and spring 21? No disruption versus extensive disruption. Well, nobody knows. So with not knowing how it's going to play out into the future and, and what's going to happen on, on the recovery from this event, you have to be prepared and be flexible and, and, be, and be nimble. And to have the sort of um, thought equity to be able to make decisions that are uh, accurate and fast. And so it's about how do, we, how do we do this risk? How do we make the best decisions with what we know and being able to be flexible to pivot around those decisions to get to the right product at the right time at the right value. And so since we don't know what the North Star is, what we're going towards, we're just going to have to realize we're going to meander our way there. But uh, ones who can use these tools to be flexible, um, to, to give themselves more time to reduce their risk by having better information, by having a little more uh, a lead time in your pocket is going to help them be more spot on in this environment to whatever comes our way. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question. Would it be easier to adopt supply chain digitization with Chinese suppliers or suppliers from any particular country and why? We're using it in all countries. So we see about even amount of, uh, of suppliers who have embraced digital on their side uh, already. Um, 
it's helping them reduce the amount of samples they have to produce. It's also helping suppliers uh, speed up the fit process to get into production quicker. So that's uh, time, uh, that's uh, productivity, that's really valuable to a factory group. So I think you have to look more also at um, CapEx spend and by countries. And so if people believe that they're going to have a long lifespan, then people invest in their businesses. And if people think they're on a precipice of something becoming difficult, they don't invest in their businesses. So right now we have to take cost out of our businesses to remain competitive everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are, if you sell widgets or if you sell bananas. You know? And so investing in, in, in these technologies is enabling factories to be more competitive on a global landscape, to overcome issues that may come their way if there's more trade wars, if there's no trade wars, if there's a country shut down. So by having this sort of um, flexibility, uh, it really gives suppliers in any country the ability to be more um, competitive and more advantageous. I don't think it's a China versus non-China focus. Uh, do you foresee brands and branding becoming more or less important as compared to perceived private label product value in the eyes of the consumer? Good question. Yeah, that's a great question. It, it comes down to value. And so Sometimes people think less branded, more private label, but private label just means cheaper. The goal of private label is to make a product that's identical to the brand in quality, in use, in experience, to just have a better value behind it in terms of cost, but not a cheaper product or an inferior product. So kind of, I want to frame that up as part of the, the part of the answer as well. Um, but we're seeing in a value period where people are uncertain that people are going to be gravitating a little bit more towards value options. So we're seeing creation of additional SKUs, additional options. How do we have more diversity throughout uh, what we're putting in the stores? So I don't think it's going to mean less branded product. I just think it means diversity of offering. And I, don't also, I also don't think it means a, a wholesale change in the percentage of private label to branded but you'll see more variety within the different price points and buckets that people sell to give people more options um, until we see what's going to happen on the recovery phase of this. So next year may be another discussion, you know, as we see how this plays out long term. But for right now, it's about variety. That's interesting. I mean, if we think about it, you know, in, in a very simple way from private label in a grocery store, right, where you usually everyone starts kind of at, at good um, and you know, then they go to better. Sometimes they move to OPP, opening price point, and then sometimes they end up with best. And so what you see, right, is this, this significant kind of growth. And, you know, in grocery, we're talking about one third penetration of private label. And I think that that's growing very rapidly right now. It, there, there's no reason that we wouldn't see, you know, some of those same characteristics in, in apparel and footwear as well. Yeah, agree. Provided you're delivering the same quality and experience as the branded experience, you'll see an enhancement of private label. Um, absolutely. And so the, the, the key thing to remember is to stay away from downgrading of products, which is not the focus of most people's private labels. It's about delivering a, a, a great value with an equally as good product, if not better. And, and that has to be sort of the core focus of how you go about building, you know, private label product. Exactly. All right. Uh, apart from digitization speed, what would you say for upcoming our upcoming supply chain trends? How about onshoring or nearshoring? That's been a big trend the last few years. You, you've seen a lot of that. And uh, when 3D printing was something that was being talked about in a big way, it was like onshore. But um, onshoring and nearshoring um, has been a topic that we've been focused on for years. And if we're producing product for the India retail market, then we should be making it in India, which we do a lot of the times. So, uh, you know, getting products made close to home is, is a big area of our focus. Uh, Central America is key in the United States, North Africa, Turkey is really important for the, for the EU market. And so that, that's already been baked into what we're doing. Um, that's part of speed and how we can unlock value, but that only gets you so far. And so you still have to reduce the decision-making process because the vast majority of the time burn is in the decision-making process, we, what we call pre-production versus production. You can speed up your supply chain and make it, uh, you can reduce it by two weeks, but you can reduce it by two months if you can make better decisions quicker with right information from day one. Uh, what other trends are you seeing in supply chain that we haven't yet discussed today? Very open-ended for you. Yeah, it is, it is, a, that is a big one. Um, the, the key is, the, well, 
The difference in the supply chain we're seeing now is that there is a need for people to work throughout the entire supply chain. You can't just be a one trick pony and do one thing. And, and you're gonna to have to be able to touch things from concept, design, sourcing, raw materials, finance, production, quality, analytics, logistics, um, and then repeat. It's that whole cycle. And so Wash and repeat, yeah. you got to do everything. It's the washing machine and the flywheel has to keep turning. So supply chain has to be about partners who can touch every piece of it and at the same time automate pieces of it and digitalize it. So we need to kind of ramp that up all the way through. But it's already happening. It's not something that um, we have to focus on. It, it, we've, been, we've been at it the last three, four years and, and speeding things up and digitalizing all those pieces of the flywheel. Yeah. All right. I think this is the last question. We, we shall see. Uh, what's your opinion about the future key impacts of current COVID-19 on supply chains if it continues for the next few months? What should we do to better respond in the limited time we have? That's a great, great, great question if that's how we end. Yeah, it's a great question. And it's all about trust and transparent communication. And everything at every level in our industry is going to be about trusting each other and having really good, uh, honest communication of what's going on and how we're going to work together. And without trust and transparency, nothing is possible. So it's really important in this day, right now, that we take that to a higher level. Um, we have to trust our partners and trust the people we're working with. And uh, and do whatever we can to help the clients all the way along uh, with whatever they need in, in this difficult time. So Jason, there's no more formal questions in the queue. I just wanted to give you a minute or two at the end to kind of sum up your thoughts and uh, hopefully live, leave us with a silver lining. Well, I, I've actually wrote down a couple of like work key words that we've been talking about. And, and if you think about everything, we, it comes back to the same things and uh, outsourcing is gonna be a big topic value creation, speed, you know, the contractor model, you know, investing in 3D with partners who can support it for you, um, you know, being local but scaling global, and um, you know, checking the checkers. We can't have this waste anymore in what we've been doing. Virtual showrooms, trust, right? These are, these are the words that we kind of used uh, numerous times throughout our, throughout our talk. And so as we're embracing the unknown and technology is also sometimes the unknown. Um, you know, you have a lot of positive outcomes because of it that you don't realize. And if you don't try, you'll never know. And this environment is forcing us all to try new things and embrace new things. And there's no better time than the present than to jump in and try new ways of doing business. You just never know. <laughs> it may lead you to somewhere you never realized. You really don't. And you also don't know in terms of what relationships will be built during this time and, you know, how business models are going to change. So it's, it's a very stressful time for many of us, but it's also a huge opportunity in terms of, you know, recreating all of ourselves. So now I, and I think that what you said really uh, resonated with me, this idea of the economies of trust and reaching out to your clients right now, I think is, is incredibly important. So yes, with that, really. we'll, we'll wrap up and everyone will have the transcript, the video available on our website at coresite.com under digital events library. And we'll also have this on YouTube. So thank you. And uh, it, I will put Jason's email here uh, for all of you to, to reach him. And thank you again for everything. And, and Jason can't thank you enough for all of your help today. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks.